If you've heard me speak before, you've seen this um, slide in all likelihood because I almost always show uh, this slide. It's the bad news, but up under there is some good news. The bad news is as an industrialized country compared to peers, we stand out like a sore thumb. And 1987 is the red bar on this chart of homicide for young men 15 to 24. Now these are actually rates per 100,000 population, so it is fair to compare one country to the other. And um, that was the, the 1987 rate. The purple bar is the 1991 rate. That was the epidemic. That was when Boston was having one a month and many cities were having a problem across the country. So this is clearly bad news. But if you put on public health glasses and you look at that data, what you begin to appreciate is that this is, in fact, a preventable problem. You look at that and say, OK, so something's going wrong in that country. They are doing something they ought not do, or there are things that they ought to be doing that they're not doing, or both. But you don't look at this and say that this is a genetic, inevitable part of the human condition. If it were, you would expect the homicide rates from country to country to be pretty similar. But when you put on public health glasses and you see this kind of wide discrepancy, you have to begin to ask questions because immediately you begin to think, this is a preventable problem. There's something we can do about it. One of the reasons that we were stitching people up and sending them out, I think, is that we had no real uh, belief that violence was preventable. We almost treated it as if it were inevitable. Most of our professional practices and most of our public policy responded to violence aggressively with very little upfront prevention activities. This compares criminal justice, the traditional framework for this problem, to the public health framework. And in addition to being upfront, it's also focused much more on populations and on prevention strategies, that being public health. We ask of the police in our communities to respond to violence when it occurs and respond aggressively. That's really not prevention. So as we pursue this sort of public health conversation, uh, I want to share three levels of prevention in public health, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now, we do some work with some young people in uh, Philadelphia, and they renamed uh, the public health levels. And I use the, the new names now because they make the, the levels very accessible, I think. Um, uh, they call them up front, in the thick, and after the fact. Up front is what we need to do for everyone. It is about gun policy. It is about redefining the superhero. It is about after school programs. It is about conflict resolution. It's not about bad kids. It's about our attitudes and social norms. It's about parents who say, you go back outside and you beat him up or I'm going to beat you. Those attitudes and social norms that need to change so that we're no longer promoting violence and encouraging violence and glamorizing violence. In the thick, has to do with children at risk. And we know a little bit about these children. They often are the ones who've witnessed violence or who've been victimized. They are the ones in neighborhoods with very few opportunities. They are the ones often in urban poor neighborhoods. And then after the fact, is the response, whether it's the medical community treating the physical injury or the police getting involved to begin the, the trial and the incarceration or punishment process. If you think about these levels of prevention and think about the um, public health criminal justice comparison, 
you come up with a chart like this. So stay with me for a minute. It's a little complicated, but I think if you um, walk through it with me, uh, it'll simplify this issue, which is a very complicated uh, issue. The work of public health is in purple here, and most of that work is upfront work. It's attitudes and social norms. For instance, you will remember the work that public health has done around smoking in the United States. I used to buy those candy cigarettes when I was about eight years old, and I used to stand in front of the television smoking, uh, well, imitating, all the beautiful people who were smoking with these little candy cigarettes. Because smoking was glamorous and was popular. I don't know if you saw Good Night and Good Luck, but it was a stark reminder that the six o'clock news was delivered by anchors who smoked throughout the newscast. It's unimaginable today, absolutely unimaginable. But that change in social norms and attitudes is a result of this thing called upfront or primary prevention. In white there is the work of criminal justice, and you'll see that most of it is after the fact. Now in the thick is shared responsibility. And I'm just putting out a challenge as you begin as a city to renew your efforts and think about new efforts to prevent violence. It is in the thick that we do not do a good job. Our professional practices are not adequate. Our public policy is not adequate. In the upfront category, we've learned. Robert Hahn and some of his colleagues from CDC published a wonderful article in uh, the American Journal of Preventive Medicine in August of last year, documenting that at every level, elementary, middle, and high school, there is on average a 15% reduction in fighting if there is some sort of universal violence prevention program or activity. Conflict resolution in the schools works, and we've got great data showing it. So basically, there should be no elementary, middle, or high school without some sort of universal conflict resolution violence prevention program based on that work, which was a meta-analysis of over 40 or 50 programs. We've got data on upfront, and even after the fact, there are some remarkable incarceration programs, rehabilitation programs. Many of them are not in effect today because of the cutbacks and our reframing of the juvenile justice issue. But in our history, we have some remarkable, effective programs. They're expensive when you get into after the fact. See, that's the problem with waiting. Uh, it's pretty expensive. In the middle, in that thick, we've got kids who are witnessing violence on a regular basis. We've got kids who are afraid. Um, the application of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, has been made by many, and I think it is a step forward, but still inadequate, because that diagnosis came from veterans who came home from war, and they were literally home from war, so it was literally post traumatic stress disorder. But if you've got violence going on in your house on a repeated basis or on your pathway to school on a repeated basis, there's something else that's not post-traumatic stress disorder, but we do know it has an impact. We professionally and as a community have to get better uh, in the thick.